This is the Cato Daily Podcast for Monday, August 2nd, 2021. I'm Caleb Brown. Between disinformation, cancel culture, a pandemic where science is among the first casualties, it's important to take stock of what we know and take stock of why we know it. Jonathan Rausch's new book, The Constitution of Knowledge, digs into why exactly our current fights over truth aren't exactly new, and he offers a way to get back to a respect for the process of creating new knowledge. You have a lot to say in this book, and a lot of it hinges upon uh, the election of 2020 and uh, the information wars that have really only intensified in the last couple of years. But something that made me, I don't know, it gave me a little bit of comfort, and maybe it shouldn't have, was that this fight about knowledge and when we know that we're acquiring knowledge and when maybe we just suspect that we're acquiring knowledge is not altogether new, that this is a very long-term struggle. It's ancient. It goes back literally thousands of years. And in its modern form, it goes back to the time of Galileo, who, as you'll recall, was in prison for practicing science. So there's absolutely nothing new about the reality wars, which is the conflict over who gets to decide what's true in a society and whether there are right ways and wrong ways to do that. And in fact, there are. There's the liberal way. And then there's all the other ways. And the book argues the liberal way is better. So how do you get how do you propose people adopt or readopt or buy in fully to the the liberal way and if you wouldn't mind describe what that is yeah i'll back up a bit and and give you the bumper stickers for the three big points of the book and then we can come back to to the question you just asked um point 1 is it's not just a marketplace of ideas. It's a constitution of knowledge. Um, marketplace of ideas is great. I, I love that metaphor. It's great for free speech, but free speech isn't enough. You need a lot of structure to get knowledge out of that. And that looks a lot like science and journalism and law and government and protocols and institutions and norms. You got to get all that stuff and you got to get it working. And that's what we're out to protect, the constitution of knowledge. It's a lot like the US constitution. The second big point is you're being manipulated. Constitution of knowledge has had enemies since day one, and now it has some very powerful ones that are using tactics like cancel culture and disinformation to undermine the constitution of knowledge or play it with chaos or coercion, uh, both illiberal, both dangerous. The third big point is they're not 10 feet tall. We are if we get our act together. But you have to defend liberal institutions and norms. They're not just self-sustaining. Um, it's a point I got from Hayek and others. You've got to understand what these rules and norms are. You've got to be confident and assertive in your defense of them. And that's, I think, where too often we're falling down. There are a lot of Hayekian points in this book. Starting with the title. Uh, sure. Uh, but that's right. And the uh, one of them was uh, the notion that we are all connected to our social networks. We all use proxies in some sense to come up with the things that we think we know. Uh, about the world. And within the scientific community, you talk a lot about the the fight over how knowledge is acquired, uh, the fight that occurred in the, the 18th and 19th centuries. Uh, and there was this uh, point made by one of the people featured in your story that's, that said, you know, everything we know has to do with uh, no one possesses all of the relevant knowledge for any field of inquiry. Yeah, that's right. The the great breakthrough, I think the greatest of all human technologies, bar none, species, literally species transforming, put the vaccine in my arm that's protecting me right now, is the constitution of knowledge. And what it says is, in effect, instead of having rulers who decide what's true and what's false and what people should believe, what goes in the textbooks, what's considered heretical and blasphemous, um, you have rules. You outsource knowledge creation to this great social science network, or I'm sorry, pardon, pardon great liberal science network. That's a term I coined in Kindly Inquisitors, a book I wrote 28 years ago that Cato published, which I'm very proud of. And that points out that once you delegate reality to this vast social network, no one in particular is in charge of it. And that has some fantastic effects. One is on freedom because you can't oppress people if there's no one in charge. 
Another is that it's error correcting and self-directing. So you get much better knowledge, much faster. Most important outcome is you get peace because instead of going to war over who's the authority over reality, you got to work it out persuasively. The difference between science and the social networks that we engage with today, which is you know distinct. You talk about social networks as a, a in a very broad way that includes uh, academic journals, uh, published papers of, of scientific inquiry, of a actual yeah, I include, knowledge. I include journalism, a lot of what government does, uh, law is part of the reality-based community, all the professions that seek truth. But uh, you know, one of my colleagues, Terrence Keeley, uh, at least within the scientific realm, he says, look, your ability to essentially consume a lot of this scientific knowledge depends in part on your ability to contribute to it. That is, understanding all of this, this sort of dense material and making sense of it. Uh, and so that's in some some way that's a qualification to be a part of that social network as more than just a consumer. And the qualifications for being a part of these other social networks are uh, an internet connection and maybe access to Photoshop. <laughs> yeah, they're they're very different ideas. Um, the the reality-based community is mostly a professional network, and it has to be because all of these fields require, including journalism, my field, requires years of training um, to learn how to deal with the protocols. And, and uh, many fields have their own specific vocabularies. You walk in the door, you have no idea what's going on. So they're inherently primarily professional. And that's a vulnerability, right? In a populist age, people think, why should I trust a bunch of elites to come up with knowledge when I can just get online and go on Facebook or Twitter and figure out for myself whether vaccines work and whether COVID is a serious virus. So yeah, um, that and that, of course, is one of the big problems that we're having today, uh, the diminution of the authority of the constitution of knowledge and, and the replacement of it with kind of random people doing random stuff. If I jump out of an airplane, and I'm, t and, Don't. I, okay. and I'm told that I have a parachute in there, I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that there's a parachute in there, or I'm going to verify or make darn sure that I really trust the person who told me that there's a parachute in there. So many of the fights that uh, are ideological right now, and so many of the fights where there is this massive disinformation or people who are under threat of cancellation for saying true things. Um, for most of us, the real world consequences of those of, of those actors, the people telling us things, the real world cons real world consequences of them being wrong are effectively nothing. And so, and so it it. it the connection then or the, your your level of concern about the veracity of the information may not be as high uh, as it would be in, an, in another field. Yeah. And there's experimental psychology to back you up on that, Caleb, which is, you know, humans are are pretty good at making determinations about truth in situations where we have personal stakes in it and we get quick feedback. Like, is that a tiger in the bush or just a breeze? Or where is the next tribe camped? Where we're not good at all, in fact, where we're consistently bad and self-deceptive is on more abstract but still important questions like what is the cause of the illness that's killing our children? You know, we're likely to talk to each other and come up with it must be that old woman who looked at me crosswise. She's hexed us. And then someone else will say, no, it's these heretics over here. Um, and then we go to war over stuff like that. So these are profound cognitive vulnerabilities. Uh, you don't need everyone, though, in a society to be a professional scientist. You don't want that. Uh -oh. you, what you need is a society not that's where everyone is truth-seeking individually, because a lot of people just aren't. They've got busy lives. They're doing other things. But you do need a society that's truth-friendly. In other words, where people are friendly to the values of the Constitution of Knowledge. It's like the U.S. Constitution. Not everyone needs to be a political activist or a politician. In fact, we're very glad they're not. But you do need a society whose values pretty much support the U.S. Constitution and oppose something like an attempt to overthrow the government um, in order to keep a, a sitting president who lost in office. And so that's 
that's where the threat, I think, becomes most worrisome, when you see the corruption of those values in the population. So what is the mindset that people, like everyone wants to believe that they are pursuing truth. They want to believe that the things that they believe are true. Um, you know, a lot of us secretly suspect that we might be wrong about some things. And so we're trying to find the the way to get out of our untrue beliefs, either for higher self-esteem or uh, just to, to, to feel better about the opinions that we have, to assure I've tested my opinions uh, as best I can by looking for the wrong, uh, looking for an alternative view that may convince me of something else. But uh, a lot of people are more often looking for armor for whatever views that they already hold. So what's, what is the mindset that people ought to have or ought to work to adopt in order to uh, be more skeptical of their own opinions? Well, you know, I come at this from a slightly different angle because humans are not wired to walk into a conversation feeling uncertain about our beliefs. And it turns out in science, as in politics, you want people to have strong initial positions. That gives the system the energy that motivates the, the debates that happen. That's Scientists are often dogmatic and fierce in defense of their views. And also in politics, James Madison understood people are not inclined to compromise. Um, they don't want to. Uh, so the trick is to design institutions, a system around them that incentivize compromise and persuasion, even when it's not what people want to do. And we do that in the Constitution with norms like, I'll give you two, but there are more. One is lawfulness. You may not like the law, but you'll follow it. And another is forbearance. You don't try to completely destroy your political opponent, rid the country of them. Sometimes you lose an election, you go on. Constitution of Knowledge has the same kind of ethos, which is you can feel as strongly as you want, but you have to have factuality. That's its version of lawfulness. You can't make stuff up. You, you, once facts are established, you need to acknowledge that. And again, forbearance. Sometimes you're going to lose the argument. That doesn't mean you have to change your own mind, but it means your ideas are not going to go in the textbooks or be the foundation of government policy. I mean, Caleb, you're, you're free to believe that Elvis Presley is still alive, and I know you do, but we're not going to send him a social security check, and, and you can live with that. So it's those kinds of values which actually are, are the basis of both our constitutions that keep society solid. And if you have those values, liberal values, um, then you don't need people to walk around scratching their head thinking, I must be wrong about everything. Getting from here to there, that is broad acceptance of uh, your view, the liberal values that animate inquiry, um, it seems impossible uh, it, or it seems very, it seems at least very difficult. I, I don't see what step one is, let alone step <laughs> seven or eight. So what are, in your view, what are the steps to uh, a broadly shared set of facts that we can all sit around and discuss rationally? Well, it'll never be a broadly shared set of facts because humans have very different views of things. And in fact, that diversity is the raw material of science and knowledge and all learning. So you don't want a world where people agree on a single reality because they'll just all be sharing in the same errors. You do want a world where people generally agree and are friendly to the system that produces the facts. And that's the constitution of knowledge, right? We don't all have to have the same ideas about tax rates, but we should all share in the system that determines what tax rates are, are going to be. Um, people call my book optimistic. I prefer to say hopeful because the constitution of knowledge, like the US constitution, um, is not self-sustaining. You need to do a lot of work. It's under attack by very sophisticated, deliberate actors. So you need to understand what they're doing and you need to be willing to defend these, these values of pluralism. Too often we're unwilling to do that. But I'll answer your concrete question about what we do in a minute. But, but I just love pointing out, especially to libertarian audiences, that you know, if, if you had said even 50 years ago that American law would be as protective of free speech and open debate as it has become, I, I think you would have been called up on drug charges. Yet here we are, we're actually doing quite well on government censorship, better than you could have predicted. Um, 
we're up against a challenge, which is that all of these forms of liberalism, which say, you know, go out and trust rules and institutions, distant places like markets, total strangers, um, you have to explain them from scratch to every generation all the time forever. And we just have to be cheerful about that. And we're, we're doing pretty well. So in that sense, I think liberal science has been in worse positions than it is now. But yeah, it's a challenging time. So so what do we do? The first thing is remember what I just said. Don't be demoralized. Remember what disinformation and canceling and all these other tactics about doing are, are trying to do is manipulate the social and media environment to divide, dominate, disorient, and ultimately demoralize their targets. So people think there's nothing I can do. I'm helpless. They've taken over the institutions. It's radical wokeness or it's disinformation or you know it's vaccine misinformation. We don't know what to do. We're helpless. That's the state they're trying to induce. There's a ton we can do and we need to start doing it. So um, we're always going to have tactics like canceling and disinformation. They're not new. Tocqueville came to America and reported on them in 1835. So what we need to do is develop some levels of immunity. Remember, social media, brand new, canceling, very new in its approach. Uh, you can't make them go away, but you can become more resistant and more resilient. And there, I kind of think of two buckets of ways to do that. One is strengthening our institutions. And that includes things like social media platforms are trying to figure out how to be more robust against disinformation. I think that'll have more to do with product design, actually, and questions of who's on or off the platform. Some of those seem small, like Twitter now interrupts you if you try to tweet out a link that you haven't read. Um, but it's those design incentives in any big rule-based system that actually pile up and make all the difference. Um, and it's also stuff like journalism is getting much savvier about how to handle conspiracy theories and disinformation. Uh, we need to, and I think maybe starting to do a better job on teaching media literacy. Um, so a lot of institutions are going to have to make a lot of adaptations to this new environment. I think that's starting, but only starting. And then the other tier is kind of the, the stuff that we can do in, as individuals in our own personal environments to strengthen the values of the Constitution and knowledge. And that includes stuff like if someone you know is being canceled, speak up for them, support them. What's happening here is an effort to isolate and shame them. And, and we have say about whether that happens to us or the people who are near us. Um, push back if you see disinformation, misinformation. Don't retweet it. Check stuff before you put it out there. And go really look at the sources. You know, Don't just assume because a friend told you that it's smart. There's a lot we can do as individuals to depolarize our communities. I'm a fan of Braver Angels, which is a national grassroots depolarization movement. I used to be on the board. And that's very important because polarization and propaganda are comrades. They feed each other. The more polarized a society is, the more open it is to propaganda that demonizes the other side, demagoguery. And the more propagandized a society is, the more polarized it will become because the point of propaganda is to divide and, and disorient. Um, so working in our communities to strengthen the civic fabric of our institutions, learn how to talk to each other better, trust each other more. All of those things and many others can make a difference. I'm sorry I don't have the three bullet points that everyone craves because this is an all of society issue. It's a civil society issue, not primarily a government issue. And that's how we have to think about it. Jonathan Rausch is author of The Constitution of Knowledge, A Defense of Truth. Subscribe to the Cato Daily Podcast pretty much anywhere and follow us on Twitter at Cato Podcast.